thank you for being here. We're going to give people one more minute. There's still some coming in to be admitted through the waiting room in the software, and then we'll get started. Okay, I think we will get started. Welcome to tonight's virtual lecture on behalf of the Friends of Fort Hunter. It is a pleasure to welcome you all. I want to just give you a couple pieces of information and then uh, we will get started with Fuller Runyon's talk on Harrisburg State Hospital. Uh, first of all, I have put the website for forthunter.org in the chat function. Uh, there's a lot of information on the website about upcoming events, especially with the holidays. We have all sorts of displays, demonstrations, reindeer, children's shop, brass concert, and other things going on at Fort Hunter for the holidays in December. So check out forthunter.org. And as I said, that website's in the chat. We also have January 11th, our next lecture with all the busyness around the holidays. We'll skip December, but our next virtual lecture is scheduled January 11th with Joyce Kiefer, the author of the Trees Remembered series, which is about uh, historical fiction set in the late 1890s, a young woman in Juniata County dealing with logging, forests, and deforestation. Um, she goes off to nursing school and comes back. So kind of a you know, development of historical fiction around this area in central Pennsylvania, specifically uh, Shade Mountain, Juniata County area along the Susquehanna. So I think that'll be very interesting to hear from Joyce Kiefer in January. Um, any questions and answers, the Q&A we will have at the end, save your questions to the end, but you can put them in the chat function and we'll get through as many as time permits uh, once Fuller's given us his presentation. And last but not least, I would like to introduce to you Fuller Runyon, who is the Operations and Maintenance Manager of the Department of General Services Annex Complex, which is the current name of the former Harrisburg State Hospital. And he has uh, enjoyed more than three decades of public service with the Department of General Services, we know he's also uh, connected with Historic Harrisburg, which is how we made the connection to find uh, out about his expertise on Harrisburg State Hospital. And he will be talking to us in his reflective journey uh, with a lot of very interesting information about that facility and its history. And without any further comment from me, we will hear from Fuller as soon as he gets his slides up and he's ready to go. Okay, can everybody hear me? All right. Thank you, Dr. Dennison, for the introduction. Thank you to the friends of 400 for the invitation to be with all of you tonight. And thank you to Dolphin County Parks and Rec for hosting us. To Katie for tech support and to Michelle and Julie and all the rest of Dolphin County for promoting it. And to my longtime friend and cheerleader, David Morrison at Historic Harrisburg for suggesting me for the task. And thank you to all of you who have joined in tonight. 
I'm a native of Milton, Pennsylvania, and I've lived in Harrisburg since 1989. Uh, I'm a 32-year employee of the Department of General Services. And uh, you can see my portfolio on the screen. Part of that is uh, I'm the operations maintenance manager of the buildings and grounds of the old Harrisburg State Hospital. I've been at this post for six years after 10 years running the official residence of the Lieutenant Governor at Fort Indian Town Gap. And 16 years before that, directing the public events at the State Capitol Complex. So tonight I'm gonna to talk about the history of the Harrisburg State Hospital, known until 1921 as the Pennsylvania State Lunatic Hospital, uh, as seen from the city of Harrisburg and surrounding communities. Uh, not just a list of dates and facts, but I'm gonna use images I found uh, through the years to kind of illustrate that. Um, my sources for tonight include two books, uh, City on the Hill, by local Renaissance man, the late Ernest Morrison, published in 1992. It's the magnum opus of the subject, really. Uh, beautifully written, remarkably well-researched with some interesting photos. The second book is a wonderful photo album of sorts called Harrisburg State Hospital, Pennsylvania's First Public Asylum, from the Images of America series by Arcadia Publishing, compiled, assembled, and written by Philip Thomas, published in 2013. Mr. Thomas's book is widely available. Amazon always has it, as does eBay. Mr. Morrison's book, on the other hand, is very hard to come by. I got my copy on eBay after searching for a couple of years. Both are very much worth getting your hands on if you can. Uh, those books will tell you the factual history of the hospital, uh, more than what I'm gonna be able to do in uh, 45 minutes tonight. Another primary source for, uh, for my presentation has been newspapers.com, a fantastic website with more than 800 million digitized newspaper pages available, all indexed and searchable, and highly addictive, I'll warn you. All of the articles I'm using tonight are from Pennsylvania newspapers. So some of the other images tonight have been found on the internet without attribution. At attribution. I'll have a source page at the end and perhaps Katie can add them as appropriate when this posts to YouTube. Uh, also, some images uh, I found just outside of my office. My predecessor, Bill Richards, left a wonderful collection of framed photographs that he found um, around the property through the years. Uh, also, before I start a disclaimer of sorts, um, any comments or opinions uh, I may happen to share are solely my own and not necessarily of my employer or our host tonight. I am not a clinician nor a professional historian, but rather a mere property professional who tends to take a deep interest in the buildings and grounds in my portfolio and who loves to share what I've found. So, um, so let's get started. Um, I'll present these in chronological order, uh, except for the occasional digression to provide texture or additional information. So yeah, I'll go off on tangents from time to time, but uh, hopefully, they will lead to better understanding of events. The story of the asylum in Harrisburg begins with Dorothea Lynn Dix and her memorial soliciting a state hospital for the insane, which was a written plea to the Pennsylvania General Assembly to fill the void in treating the poor and indigent mentally ill. I'll include a link at the end where you can read it. Uh, Pennsylvania was the third state to receive Ms. Dix's reporting after Massachusetts and Rhode Island. Um, her methods were uh, astonishing, actually, uh, for the time. Uh, she traveled, uh, you know, all over the state. She visited every poorhouse, almshouse, every jail, and every county. And uh, there, there's uh, one account where she rode on a log in the in, in a stream for many hours to go from uh, one point to another. It's really remarkable. Uh, so after she had uh, compiled this incredible uh, report, uh, she gave it to the General Assembly and it was read uh, to the General Assembly. So a memorial, uh, for those who don't know, in those days was basically what this is, a written plea to those in power. Remember, uh, Dorothea Dix couldn't vote. Uh, so her, her way of, of going to power was to write these memorials and present them and uh, and hope that the people in power would take action uh, on the, the topic and, and take action they did. 
uh, th this one here was um, one of my favorite quotes from her report. Uh, this subject comes home to all, to everyone on this ground, all like may suffer, the rich and the poor, the learned and the uneducated, the young, the mature and the aged. From this malady, none are sure of exemption and often reverses of fortune teach that none are so prosperous that they may not need to share the asylum, which this solicited now to shelter others. That's powerful because uh, mental illness is definitely something that can can happen to uh, to anyone. Uh, this slide here is uh, just an excerpt from uh, from her visit in the, the Somerset County in Somerset, and uh, she talks about how uh, you know the jail didn't make any sense. They had a couple that was uh, convicted of adultery, and they they actually put them together in the jail cell. Um, they didn't have a poor house. Uh, they would actually sell them off to people who uh, were willing to take them as laborers, which is astonishing. Um, yeah, interesting stuff. So, yeah, it was very powerful. Uh, she uh, that was read to the General Assembly on uh, February 3rd and by March 8th, a bill was reported out of committee. So, uh, and the, the bill was passed and signed by Governor Francis Schunk on April 14th. Yeah, it's, uh, that's pretty quick. Uh, the law established a commission and uh, they published their first report in January of 1846. So let's, what did that say? So um, in the report, they disclosed that they had purchased a farm within one and a half miles of Harrisburg of about 130 acres. And you can see here that it's a well improved arable and meadow land. With a sufficiency of timber, it has springs and streams of never failing water and offers a site for the erection of the building. Uh, yeah, they found a good, good hunk of land. I'm going to tell you a little bit about that in a minute. But first, uh, they were very fortunate. They were able to get John Haviland to be the architect of the building. So John Haviland, uh, for those who may not be aware, uh, he's probably best known for uh, designing the Eastern State Penitentiary in Philadelphia. Uh, that was very cutting edge at the time. Um, he, he did a lot of other things around the Philadelphia area that are uh, very well known. Uh, this may have been his last project because he uh, passed away not long after this building was, was completed. So uh, if you see in here, the building was uh, 500 feet long. Uh, just by comparison, uh, the Capitol building currently downtown in Harrisburg is 520 feet long. This building was massive. So this image here, uh, I doubt any of you have seen. Uh, this hangs in my office. It's a plat map of the farm with the asylum building superimposed. So the farm to the north was the preferred land, but the agents for Jacob Ridgeway sold it to another buyer before a deal can be made. Now, I don't know if this is the Jacob Ridgeway uh, that owned land all over Pennsylvania. In fact, uh, most of Elk County, uh, and of course the borough of Ridgeway is named after him. I don't know if it's the same person. I haven't had the opportunity to uh, check that out. But but if it was, I believe he was dead by this time. So it, it was his, his estate who was uh, selling the land. So it probably was hard to uh, you know pin those folks down at the time. But anyway, they, they were fine. They quickly moved on to their second choice. I don't know if you can read this. Uh, the asylum site <clears throat> was known as Spruce Run Farm, which had been surveyed by former owner John Sale in 1844. So Mr. Sale was an Irish-born farmer who had a good punk of land that stretched from East Harrisburg all the way up to about where Elmerton Avenue is now, uh, including what is now the Harrisburg Cemetery. Uh, Mr. Sale passed in 1850, 1850 and his widow, Harriet Sales, uh, lived at their homestead at 13th Street and Jonestown Road into the 1880s. So that uh, initial, what's it say, 127 acres, 99 perches, uh, that eventually grew to about 1,000 acres. Um, uh, farming was a big part of uh, this, uh, this program, and uh, we might talk about that a little bit uh, later too, farming and livestock. So by the time of this blurb, which was in the uh, Pittsburgh Daily Post, February 22nd, 1851, the commission's work was winding down. The building was nearing completion and a board of trustees 
and a superintendent had been chosen. The first superintendent was Dr. John Kerwin, a protege of Dr. Thomas Kirkbride, who ran the Pennsylvania Hospital for the Insane in West Philadelphia. More on Dr. Kirkbride in a minute. Dr. Kerwin would remain at his post in Harrisburg until January of 1881. That's 30 years. Uh, and after that, he went on to lead Pennsylvania State Mental Health Facilities in uh, Warren, Pennsylvania, followed by Danville, and finally Dixmont out in Allegheny County. That's almost 50 years, all told, running mental health facilities by the time he retired in 1900. When he was all done, he returned to Harrisburg, where he passed away in 1901. Um, this is the earliest known image of the Pennsylvania State Lunatic Hospital. It is an etching by Thomas Sinclair, and it appears as the frontispiece for bylaws of the Pennsylvania State Lunatic Asylum at Harrisburg with the acts of the legislature establishing the same. Uh, I'll leave a link for this too. You can read it. It's, uh, it's, it's pretty interesting. Um, the building was based on a philosophy of Dr. Kirkbride, who eventually wrote a book about it in which he laid out the basic floor plan and described what type of care would occur in the different levels and sections. Um, he was very detailed, uh, even describing the, uh, the type of heating and, uh, and so forth. And, uh, and he was a physician, a psychiatrist. So he was uh, very well-rounded. Uh, the building was shaped in such a way as to maximize sunlight and moving air. So you see that kind of jagged, uh, uh, outline of the building. So the idea was, uh, you know, if you had a wind going across, it, more of it would be caught by the, the uh, this building shape in this manner. Uh, the heating plant was to the rear of the building, not inside the building itself, in a building that also housed the laundry and uh, where they stored the coal. So it was a coal force, coal fired uh, steam heating system. Um, this style of building dominated the mental health field for decades. Uh, there are some that are still standing, uh, for example, Danville State Hospital. So one reason we have so much knowledge about the early decades of the asylum is that Dr. Kerwin kept a diary. So uh, this is the first page of the diary, which shows the facility opening on October 1st, 1851, and receipt of the first patient, Mrs. Bishop, on October 6th. Uh, I'll leave a link uh, where you can read this too. As you can see, it's a little bit of a slog because it's uh, it's all written in uh, in his uh, his hand, but um, it's it's a good read. It's very interesting stuff. A lot of it's just the weather, things like that. But uh, he names a lot of people, and it's it's deep. Uh, for example, several pages later, we learn that on April second, eighteen fifty two, a Mister Runyon was taken home by his brothers. Well, I don't, I don't know who that was, obviously, but I can say that my great, 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 great grandfather, Joshua Runyon, had a brother who had some mental difficulties. Uh, his brother eventually ended his life by drinking loud. So it's, uh, it's possible that might be, be one of my relatives. So one question I got a lot back when we were still doing public tours was, was anyone famous a patient here? And the answer is yes. One of America's greatest early poets and writers, Charles Benno Hoffman, was a patient here beginning in 1854. So Hoffman was considered a peer of Longfellow, Washington Irving, Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr., people like that. So he was, he was a real deal. He uh, started the Knickerbocker Magazine and uh, worked for some other, uh, some big, big names. He, he was the real deal. Um, as his mental illness set in, his memory was stuck in that time. And over time, he would talk about things that happened, you know, years ago, you know, longer time passing as, as time went on, as if it had just occurred yesterday. He was but 48 years old when he was committed. Mr. Hoffman passed away here on June 17th, 1884, at the age of 78, after 30 years as a patient. He was buried in his hometown of Philadelphia. Um, Again, if you if there's any images on here that anybody you know would like to uh, have or see again, uh, let me know and I'll I'll be glad to uh, share those with you. Uh, there is one here that you'll see a little bit later that you're gonna have to purchase, but we'll get we'll get to that when we get there. So another frequent question is uh, that I got as a 
giving tours was, uh, was the president of the United States ever here. So on this page of Dr. Kerwin's diary, diary, we learned that, doc, that President Franklin Pierce visited on September 27, 1855. So that, that's right there in the middle, September 27th, okay? So I found a newspaper article about that. So the president had come to Harrisburg to attend a large agricultural fair. So on the 27th, he was one of 40,000 people to visit the Harrisburg fairgrounds. If, if somebody wants to put in the chat uh, where that was, uh, that would be great because I have no idea. But to, to be able to hold 40,000 people that fairground must have been uh, enormous. Uh, so President Pierce uh, then visited the asylum, making that side trip with former Governor Bigler. Uh, incidentally, uh, First Lady Jane Pierce was a recluse and did not travel with the president. Uh, she suffered terribly from depression, as did President Pierce. And that was uh, at, exacerbated by the death of their son, Benjamin, who was killed in their presence in a train wreck leading up to the inauguration. So, uh, I mean, I, of course, I, we have no way of knowing, but it's possible that um, that may be why he was uh, especially interested in, in mental health and seeing the asylum. So that was 1855. So also in 1855, uh, this beauty was published. So this is a well-known bird's eye uh, view of Harrisburg by the E. Soxy and Company. Um, you can get this thing anywhere. You can get it as a poster. Uh, you can get it on canvas. Uh, I think it's really beautiful. I've seen it in offices and things. It's, it's uh, really nice. If you look at it a little bit closer, you'll see that the hospital is featured twice, okay, at the top and then at the bottom. So at the top, uh, you may have seen this image before. This was on the, the opening uh, slide and also on the, uh, the advertisement for this lecture. Um, I especially like this image because it has the two cottages in the front of the hospital, which are still here. So uh, those are the only remaining uh, structures from the original hospital. So that, that's pretty cool. Then at the bottom, you see this uh, image here. It looks like it was taken from the, the 83 bridge. <laughs> so, and uh, you see the Capitol, the old red brick Capitol, and then off in the distance on the hill, you can see the Pennsylvania State Lunatic Hospital. Okay. Pretty cool. So uh, six years later, in May of 1861, this etching was in Harper's Weekly, and it's featuring Camp Curtin. Uh, near Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, a rendezvous of the Pennsylvania Volunteers. So I've included it today because if you look off to the right, there is the Pennsylvania State Lunatic Hospital, okay? So uh, every now and then I'll encounter someone here that's uh, walking around with a metal detector, you know, poking around, seeing what they can, they can find. Now, uh, unfortunately, that's not allowed by uh, Commonwealth policy. But, uh, you know, when I go to move them along, I, I usually stop and talk to them. And uh, more times than not, they're looking for spent balls and bullets from uh, the Camp Curtin days, uh, knowing that some of the training occurred on hospital property. And thinking, naturally, since the hospital's up here, that the training must have occurred up here. But as you can see uh, from this image, the training was probably down about where the farm show is, uh, you know, maybe even uh, a little north of there. Um, now, we do know, however, that the soldiers did climb the hill to the hospital for an occasional bath and also for a hot cup of coffee. So we're going to move ahead a little bit to uh, January of 1881. And here we learn that after 30 years at the helm, Dr. Kerwin has not been reelected, but rather replaced with his second in command, Dr. Jerome Gerhardt. Um, no word on why exactly, but if, if you read this little blurb, uh, obviously there were rumblings about something. But don't worry about Dr. Kerwin. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, he just kept on keeping on. This, this made me chuckle. Uh, several weeks later, uh, during an appropriations hearing, Dr. Kerwin, who had by then moved on to head Warren State Hospital, was invited to hang around for the Harrisburg discussion. And Dr. Kerwin contradicted one of the Harrisburg trustees about the need for additional water facilities. 
And of course, it, as you read this, that was not appreciated by the Harrisburg trustee. But we do know that uh, a little bit later, uh, a few weeks later, in fact, uh, a new well was dug at Harrisburg at a depth of 995 feet. So maybe Dr. Kerwin didn't think so, but, but, but somebody did. That's a deep well, isn't it, 995? This uh, caught my eye. Uh, Ernest Morrison actually talks about this, uh, this incident in his book a little bit. Um, in August of 1885, it was learned that a woman named Addie was a patient at Harrisburg for over 27 years, though she was not mentally ill. Uh, turns out she'd been committed by her father, physician, along with a friend of his who was a judge, because she had run up a bunch of debt and then foolishly sold the items for which she had assumed the debt. So uh, her father and this pal, they figured it would be better to, for her to be in the asylum than in jail, and then they could keep the family name clean. But someone at the Indiana Weekly Messenger pointed out, the fact that a perfectly sane woman has been confined for 27 years is a sad commentary on the management of the institution. If the superintendent failed in that time to discover the woman was not insane, he is unfit for the position. And if you knew she was sane and still kept her in confinement, he should be prosecuted. In either event, he is responsible for a great wrong and is not the right man in the right place. It's uh, some pretty well-placed public outrage there. By the way, the only way uh, she finally got out after that 27 years is they had, they had established a new process where you could uh, petition the person in, in power. I, I, can't, I, I apologize for not having uh, a slide on that. And then that person would look into it and uh, that's what she did. So otherwise uh, she may have just stayed there and passed away there. Interesting. So this image here is uh, dated 1889. Now it looks like a Sanborn fire insurance map, but it says that it's just a book from a book of ma or a map from a book of maps. I found it on eBay. Uh, we'll see an actual Sanborn map later, and they're very similar. But what's interesting about this uh, this map is you can see that in 1887 they added the two branch buildings. So um, the men were at the north branch, and the women were at the south branch. Uh, these buildings added space for about 300 additional patients. So by 1889, they were up to 600, 700 patients. By 1891, uh, the population of the asylum reached 1,000 patients. Uh, you can also see on here, uh, down in the uh, area where the green belt is now, there was a retention pond. And I don't know how, if I can expand this, blow it up. Uh, it's kind of blurry. So you have an ice house and uh, yeah, interesting stuff. That's long gone. Here's a fun one. So Dr. William Wright uh, had been the first assistant to Superintendent Dr. Henry Orth. Remember that name. So Dr. Uh, Wright had traveled abroad to study and showed up upon his return to Harrisburg with a set of golf clubs and boxes of golf balls, having learned the sport while in Scotland. So, so this article is actually from a 1927 uh, newspaper, but it's referencing 1893, which is when uh, Dr. Wright uh, came to Harrisburg. So uh, if you, uh, you probably don't, won't be able to read it here, but again, I'll, I'll make these available to anybody that wants them. But the, the one thing that made me laugh was down toward the bottom where so he usually played by himself, and uh, he remembered that people would pass by and they would say things like, poor fellow, I presume he does that all day. I guess that's why he's here. So uh, also that year, um, Philadelphia architect Addison Hutton was hired to rebuild the hospital in the cottage plan. Uh, meaning a set of smaller two and three story buildings arrayed in a symmetrical pattern with distance in between, as opposed to having everything in a large building. So the first building up was the administration building, which was completed in 1895. Um, that building, of course, is still, still here. Uh, the building was faced with steel and brick and Hummelstown brownstone. 
The building was uh, designed and built to replace the center portion of the original Kirkbride building, which had basically begun to fall apart and had to be condemned. In the background of this uh, photo here, you can see uh, to the left, you can see a portion of the Kirkbride building. It almost looks like they're doing something at the, at the roof line of it. But part of the building remained for a few more years. They, so in other words, they tore down the center part with the dome and, and so forth. And uh, yeah, so you were, uh, that's what they did. So uh, this is a page of a 1901 map from Harrisburg a City Map Book, and it shows the brand new hospital for the chronic insane. And uh, as you look at this, you can kind of see the cottage plan uh, beginning to take shape. Uh, again, oh, this one's a little clearer at the bottom there. Let me just draw that in a little bit. So, uh, so this one here, you can see the north branch. Again, that was men. South branch, that was uh, the women. Uh, now, this does show the entire Kirkbride building, but I, I'm, I know that by 1901, the center part had been abolished. But then you can see the new uh, administration building in front there by the driveway. Fuller, sorry, we lost your internet for a minute. So we're on the map. Yes. Were we supposed to be seeing a photograph of the new building? You should be seeing a uh, a map. Okay, just be sure that's what make sure we were seeing the right thing because yep. your internet said no connection, then came back. Thanks. Uh, okay. Mm, all right. Thank you. Uh, this image was posted on a Harrisburg Facebook page. Um, I loved it. As soon as I saw it, um, others that looked at it, they remarked about the old barn. It, some people actually remember driving past that. It was a gas station, I guess, at one point. Um, others remarked about the schoolhouse down there with the, you know, the little tower. That's still there. It's apartments now. And then still others uh, looked at the top of the image and saw the Rockville Bridge, which at that time was only a few years old. But what I saw was the chronic insane building, um, which uh, I can see out of my window right now. That's, uh, we call it Willow Oak now. So yeah, that's pretty cool. I apologize for the quality of this. Uh, one thing about newspapers.com, uh, most of the digital images are from microfilm. And of course, microfilm degrades and so forth and sometimes the initial uh, images aren't that great to begin with but i included it here because i think it's really cool um, it was done in uh, may of 1922 by major maxwell of underwood and underwood new york photographers and uh, when you look at this you can see what transpired uh, over the next several years so from the that 1901 uh, or 1906 picture 1901 map you can see uh, that basically the uh, the cottage plan had come to fruition. It was a construction frenzy. So uh, in that time, they uh, built a central kitchen and cold storage. They built a morgue down in the uh, down by where the green belt is now. Uh, male and female wards, nurses' homes, a solarium, and a chapel. So this flurry of building occurred almost entirely under the watchful eye of Superintendent Dr. Henry Orth, who ran the hospital from 1891 until his retirement in 1917. This one here is a little bit clearer for you. So this image was taken by Colonel Victor Dolan, and uh, I just think it's beautiful. Uh, I found this on the Hagley Museum Digital Archives. Hagley Museum, for those who don't know, is in uh, Wilmington, Delaware. And they have a wonderful uh, digital archive, and I'll have a link uh, to that in, the, in my sources, too. Now, there's a lot to, to uh, digest here. Um, I mean, this, this picture is just astonishingly, it's just incredible to me. But I, I want to point out something that uh, was one of the first things that I, that I worked on when I, when I came here six years ago, uh, namely... So what you're seeing here is the uh, the northern end of the chronic insane building. Uh, to the left is the uh, uh, male nurses home, and that that hump in the center, that is the original hospital cemetery. Okay, 
So I've read, you know, through the years, articles about it in, uh, you know, the Patriot News and on Penn Live where, you know, everybody's wondering, oh, my God, where was the cemetery? Well, we know where the cemetery was. It was right there. OK. And if you look at it closely, you can actually see uh, maybe not all nine headstones, uh, but you can see a bunch of headstones on top. So you may be wondering, why is it situated like that? OK, so as the as the state hospital grew, they graded it uh, so that the entire hospital would be the same uh, level okay let's go back a slide so you can see they really did a remarkable job um the entire state hospital is pretty much on the same level and that was done by uh by grading work okay so obviously you can't grade through a cemetery right so they went around it so the, the result was this thing set up 20 feet above grade and by the way this picture uh is 1924 um that was already like that for like 25 years, okay? But uh, not to worry. Um, in uh, November of 1927, Dauphin County Court gave the go-ahead to relocate the cemetery. So the 230 bodies and nine headstones were moved up on top of the hill opposite the moor. Uh, what's really cool about it is uh, when there's a light snow here, you can still see the, the inclined cart path that they made to roll the carts up, past them, you know, down the hill, past the moor, over the little creek, and then up the hill to where the, the current cemetery is. It's, uh, yeah. Oh, I, the other thing I like about this newspaper article, this is from the Harrisburg Evening News uh, in November 27. If you look down toward the bottom, they actually give the names and dates from the headstones. Now, this is important because uh, when I came over here, I wanted to put that cemetery and the graves on uh, findagrave.com. Uh, I'm a genealogist in my free time, and uh, that, that site is very important to me, and it was neat to be able to do that. And some of the stones, you can't read them anymore, but because of this 1927 newspaper article, I have the names and, uh, and some dates, the dates of death. So, yeah. Uh, this here is the actual legal notice. So. 230 bodies and only nine headstones. And they, like, by law, they had to publish this uh, decree so that if somebody wanted to come and collect their loved one's remains, they could. But I'm not sure how that would even happen unless it was one of the, the people that was uh, connected to uh, to one of the, the graves. So uh, this image here, I apologize for the quality. Uh, this one is hanging outside my office. This one here uh, is by... Uh, Samuel Cunert, who is a local guy, um, his photographs are in the Harrisburg State Archives if anybody wants to look at those. But um, I included this one today because uh, you can see uh, top center, the, that is the married nurse's home. That was built in the, the spot where the cemetery was. Okay, that building's still here. We call it Hemlock Hall now. Uh, for many, many years, it was a Catholic Charities um, uh, homeless shelter. Okay. But uh, also interesting about this photo is, this is probably taken about 1929, I'm going to say, is down in the uh, lower right corner, you can see the new cemetery. It's, uh, it's behind uh, Samuel Cunert's uh, uh, stamp. So uh, you get the original site in this picture and the, uh, the site of the, of the new cemetery. So uh, this is a Sanborn fire map. Uh, if anybody's not familiar with those, uh, they're really wonderful. Uh, they didn't publish them uh, constantly. They were only done periodically, like over several years. But uh, as you can see here, they give a lot of information uh, for uh, fire insurance purposes. So, you know, you'll see that what the floors are made out of and things like that. Just to give you a rough idea, the pink ones are brick buildings. Uh, the brown ones are either stone, uh, concrete, or masonry, and then the yellow ones are frame houses. And they have these for many, many uh, boroughs and cities in in, uh, in the United States. Penn State probably has the biggest collection, although uh, you can access those through the uh, the uh, state library in the in the forum building whenever, whenever that opens back up again. But here you can really see. The, uh, the the cottage plan, you know, come to fruition. It's uh, it's really a neat a neat image. Oh, also notice the uh, the retention pond and the ice house is gone. 
That's because in 1927, an irate patient burned it to the ground. Uh, because by then they could get ice other ways, they just uh, filled that in and uh, they never rebuilt the ice house. Uh, for the, the green belt fans, when you're down there, you can sort of figure out where some of this stuff was. You can kind of still see the, the outlines, which is, which is pretty cool. So how are we doing for time? All right. So a recurring problem throughout the history of the hospital has been overcrowding. Um, the solution in 1937 was uh, to stop accepting patients. Um, and it was a pro getting to be a real problem. The real solution, however, was another building spree. So this time uh, they were able to do it through the WPA. So included uh, was a new tubercular center, a new central kitchen and dining facility, a new power and steam plant, and two physicians' cottages down by the gate at Cameron and McClay. So this particular spree occurred during the uh, superintendency of Dr. Howard K. Petrie, okay? Um, Petrie, he loved Harrisburg. When, when he came here to be a uh, superintendent, he was involved in so many things in Harrisburg. I think he spoke to every group that existed. It, it's just unbelievable. And uh, he was an advocate, of course, for, uh, you know, a mental hygiene and, and things that could avoid, help avoid people uh, becoming where they'd have to, to uh, live in a facility like this. Now, there was one other building uh, period in the 50s. Uh, they built three gigantic buildings, uh, the admissions building in Hillcrest, uh, which were designed by Laurie and Green. Uh, those of you that know architecture and know Harrisburg, you know that they have many, many buildings uh, scattered around Harrisburg. And uh, the, also uh, in the 50s, they built the, uh, the Eaton building, which is uh, enormous. Um, so. That was it. Other than the maintenance building, which I'm sitting in right now, there have been no new structures uh, added since that time. Uh, the maintenance building was built in 63. So I mentioned the gate at Cameron and McClay. Uh, this is the photo that I got from the uh, Historical Society of Dolphin County. Um, I asked for it and they provided it to me. Uh, this and many other wonderful pictures can be purchased on their website. Um, so this one here has got a lot going. There's a lot here to like too, okay? Um, so this photo ran in the January 25th, 1938 evening news to show how terrible farm sh show traffic was. So in 38, the farm show had been there, what, eight, uh, seven, eight years, okay? And the traffic was terrible. So, but this picture must've helped because uh, two years later, they had a brand new bridge. Now that bridge that opened in 1940, that's the one that we go over now. And I don't know if the, uh, all of you know that build that bridge is slated to be replaced again, but um, you can probably tell the thing that I really like about this picture. Okay, so at the bottom of the hill, so at top uh, right center, you can see the gatehouse. Uh, by the way, that we figure that was built in about 1875. It was the steward's cottage, and then uh, when they put the gate there, uh, it became the gatehouse. And then up on the hill, you can see the uh, the admin building. So a lot of these pictures that I've, I've shared with you tonight, uh, you can see the state hospital from the community, okay? Uh, and if you, if you noticed on the one slide I had from the uh, commissioners when they purchased the land, um, that was done intentionally. They wanted the state hospital to be on an eminence where people could see it and they could see the city, okay? And it's interesting too because the, the state hospital is such a part of our community. Um, I didn't share everything that I, I found, uh, you know, time wouldn't permit it, but it, it's just a, amazing to me how uh, much it was part of the community and, and you could see it. And, you know, since that time, it's become forested in front of the buildings. And now the state hospital is this hidden away uh, uh, place. So I moved to Harrisburg in 89 and uh, I worked for general services and uh, I didn't even know this was here. Okay, so I did come up here one time during the 90s to, uh, I had to visit Tech 5, um, which was brand new at the time. And then in the early 2000s, uh, a, a local attorney, I can't remember his name anymore, he, he did an event called the Great Adventure Challenge and we were looking for a place to do a running race. 
and uh, someone suggested up here. That was the first time I'd ever come up here, and I was gobsmacked by just how beautiful it was. It was like going around a college campus, but it's so hidden away. I meet people all the time that don't know this is up here, and I think it's because of that veil that's been uh, pulled over it by the, the, the heavy trees and so forth. Yeah, just, a, just a thought. Uh, this uh, hangs outside my office as well. So this uh, sh again shows how thinly uh, forested the front of the campus was. Um, yeah, interesting. Uh, Got to talk about baseball. So um, this one's about Twilight Baseball, all right? So uh, I coached Twilight Baseball from time to time. And I found many, many articles through the years about how good the Harrisburg State Hospital team was. Okay. So in this particular game, their uh, lefty hurler and slugger, Tuffy Hauser, uh, led the way, and uh, the State Hospital beat Paxton. And it was and it was away game. So uh, that's interesting too. I, I don't know how many away games they played, but uh, uh, the the team was made up of uh, patients and staff. So I just thought that was. I wanted to share that. So here's where we start to see uh, the, the gradual wind down. Uh, a series of things occurred that, uh, that kind of brought the curtain down over the next, uh, what, 40 years, 50 years. So in uh, 1958, uh, the Department of Public Welfare had taken over from the trustees, and then uh, Secretary Harry Shapiro banned hospital employees from living on site. So up to that time, uh, many of your attendants, uh, farmers and so forth, uh, farm uh, managers, they all lived on site. So after that point, it was banned. Um, we thought it was inappropriate. Then uh, 14 years later, uh, hospital patients could no longer work at the facility or in its farms unless they were paid a minimum wage. So, you know, leading up to this uh, for many, many uh, decades, the, you know, farm work, uh, you know, laundry, kitchen, what have you, um, that was part of your treatment, okay, and also help pay your, uh, you know, for what it would cost for your treatment. So, uh, in this uh, court case in uh, 1973, um, that was ended. So, of course, it didn't take too long. Uh, June 30th, 1976, uh, the Harrisburg State Hospital stopped its farm program. Uh, this article is from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette in April of 76. Um, they found that without the patient labor, the farms were no, lo no longer profitable. And one by one, the hospitals gave them up. You remember, uh, I was telling you at one point, this had been up to 1,000 acres. So what happened was they started transferring property elsewhere. Now, this had obviously happened before that. The, the farm show is on former state hospital property. The ag buildings are. Uh, but after this, uh, after the farming ended, uh, they transferred to state police headquarters, and then it wasn't too long later till uh, a game commission, fish and boat commission, and so forth. Those those were all on the on former state hospital ground. So the hospital became more and more expensive to run. Uh, by 1978, this is from the York Dispatch, September 15, 1978. By by then, Harrisburg Hospital was down to about 500 patients and about just as many staff. So uh, we can all kind of see where the, this is headed, but it didn't make it any less painful um, that uh, January 6, 2005, it was announced that Harrisburg State Hospital, the oldest hospital in the system, would close within the year. Now, they chose Harrisburg because they felt that the capital region could best withstand the loss of jobs and other economic benefits associated with the facility. Um, I think a lot of people that worked here, I actually have a couple on staff here now that worked here when it, when it was a state hospital. And they just believe that because it was the first one and so forth, that it would never close. So even though uh, they gave them a year's notice and they kind of heard the rumblings, it was very painful for those folks um, when it finally did happen. And then uh, finally, on January 27th, 2006, the Harrisburg State Hospital ceased operations. Uh, the remaining 50 patients remain on site under the care of community organizations pending transfer to another hospital. Uh, later that same year, Department of General Services took over operations and maintenance of the facility, which was still home to several offices of the Department of Public Welfare and other affiliated agencies, and the DGS Annex Complex was born. Um, 
this is uh, a source page. You know, I think I got everything on here. That's all I got for tonight, folks. Uh, I'd love to have your questions. And uh, I'm going to try to uh, give this back here. If I can. Thank you very much, Fuller. Um, we do have some questions. I think you might have answered one. When is, did the last patient leave or die? And you said they looks like they discharged in 2006. You Correct. said, um, you know, and the remaining were trans, you know, they're pending transfer to other places. So, so well, I didn't mention in my talk uh, the fact that over the years they they tried to make the uh, state hospital system more regional. So, uh, like. The Harrisburg State Hospital had several counties in the South Central area that were, uh, you know, in their um, grouping. So when the hospital, uh, when they announced the hospital was closing, they had to figure out where best to move these people. Now there were other considerations too. You know, what was their malady? What was, you know, what kind of help? What kind of care did they need? But I know a lot of them went to Danville. Uh, a lot went to Warnersville. Um, they were very good to the employees here in so much as uh, they gave them the opportunity to go to some of those other facilities. And as I mentioned before, I have people on staff and I had more um, still before that were employees here when it was a state hospital. So they were given the opportunity to stay with general services and work in the same or maybe a different capacity. I get some of the people that stayed were uh, they were, worked in dietary previously. And when they stayed with general services, uh, they became, you know, housekeepers, uh, custodial workers, things of that nature. Are people still able to walk the grounds? So the grounds are open every day, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Okay. That's uh, seven days a week. And you are absolutely able to walk the grounds. Uh, um, you know, we, we try to uh, keep people out of here at, at night um, just for safety reasons and for other reasons, too. Uh, what about so, yeah. uh, the status of the tunnels that connected the building? What is the status of the tunnels? Well, the, the tunnels, uh, you know, and I apologize for not bringing this up because that's a fascinating uh, subject, the tunnels up here. So I, I guess a lot of you know that the buildings are connected by a, a system of tunnels. And uh, through the years of the hospital, they use those for transporting uh, just about everything, you know, that, that they didn't want to take outside. So, you know, you might transport patients. You might transport food. Uh, maintenance might transport uh, equipment, materials, things of that nature. Uh, what, what's interesting from a maintenance standpoint is over the years, they added to the tunnels um, steam lines, potable water lines, uh, fiber optic wiring, um, you know, electric. I mean, I could just go on and on. So uh, the, the tunnels are a uh, they have a lot of different different things in them. So uh, it was a solution to uh, many problems uh, through the years. There's a question I don't quite understand. Something about renting the old schoolhouse in Lingolstown. Do you does that ring a bell? Or perhaps what the person meant was that old schoolhouse in what you pointed out on the map is now the apartments kind of behind. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. In yeah that's totally that's, that's there. The only thing I could think of related to that question. Yeah, that schoolhouse, that's that's Pembroke, by the way. That's Pembroke, not Lingle's yeah. So, so I that, that picture, I don't know if I mentioned it, that picture was taken from Reservoir Park. Uh, I tried to recreate it a couple of years ago, um, but I need to go up there when it's uh, in the winter time because it, it was too, the trees were too bushy. But I was trying to recreate that. that Are any of the buildings still in use? Uh, yeah, we have uh, uh, Galdensia has a drug and alcohol uh, rehabilitation center on site, and uh, but we got all the all the state employees are are off. They're uh, most of them are in a new building on Seventh uh, Street where the old DNH warehouse uh, used to be. What are the next plans for the grounds? Well, there's uh, people above me working very hard on that. And uh, I hope to have a little bit of information in the next year. Uh, we'll just have to see. We just had an election yesterday, so we have a, a new administration, and you know they may have ideas about what they what they would like to see happen. But uh, um, yeah, just stay tuned, right? Uh, is it true that movies have been filmed on the grounds? Well, I remember them filming Girl Interrupted. So 
Girl Interrupt is probably the most famous one. And of course, there were Academy Awards affiliated with that. But there was also uh, a movie with Ernest Borgnine after DGS took it over. I can't think of the name of it. Uh, maybe somebody can type that in the chat. Uh, when I got here, they were filming, uh, what was that called? It was a movie about uh, yeah, James Spader was supposed to be in it, but he, we never saw him. And then back in the 70s, uh, I'm terrible at this. Uh, they, they did a movie with um, the guy from Green Acres. He was the star. Ed Albert? Eddie Albert? Eddie Albert. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, they did a movie in the 70s where they, they shot some of it in, uh, I think that one was Beachmont. Of course, Girl Interrupted was was the green building, uh, number 22. So, yeah, there's been quite a few uh, here. Back in uh, 2020, I guess it was, uh, Ghost Nation uh, uh, did an episode here. So, it's a neat spot for many reasons. I will say to our uh, friends uh, online with us that uh, William, and Mur William Murray, a historian, local historian, has put some information in the chat about the records and archives being at the state archives in Harrisburg and how you can hire an archivist to search them for people. Um, and, you know, it's restricted and so forth and so forth. But if you're interested in that, um, right. he's put the information in there for you. Oh, one, one other question I used to get was what happened to all the the antiques and all the stuff from the, the Dix Museum? All that stuff was taken down to Wernersville. Now, I don't know if they've opened it since uh, the pandemic, but they do have a little museum of sorts down there. So, so some of that stuff uh, can be viewed down there, but I'm sure you have to make an appointment. Um, but, yeah, so that stuff's still floating around. It's just, it's just not here anymore. It says a film, another Harvest Moon was filmed there in 2009. Yeah, that's the one with Ernest Borgnine. Thank you. The TV series Ghost Nation filmed two episodes there in 2021. Yeah. And the TV series Ghost Lab filled an episode there in 2010. Okay, excellent. Very good. Thank you. It says um, oh, Nancy, Nancy also gave us another Harvest Moon. She got to it before. In chat before I got to it online. Uh, and I'm sure I join the poster of this uh, in chat and everyone else in saying this was a most enjoyable, enlightening presentation, um, especially appreciating your regard for the site and the respect for its history. So I, I think we all share in that, uh, in expressing that thought. Any other questions from anyone? I don't see any more, um, but thank you. Another thank you um, for your excellent care of the grounds from a DHS employee. So um, uh, thank you. Thank you very much to Fuller Runyon and uh, uh, aside, yes, thank you to David Morrison who connected us uh, at, from Historic Harrisburg. And don't forget to check out forthunter.org for upcoming events and to register uh, once we get that up in a few weeks for uh, the January lecture on the historical fiction set in the 1890s in Juniata County from Joyce Kiefer. So that'll be another exciting uh, lecture in January. But thank you very much, Fuller. And thank, thank you, everyone, you guys for joining, joining us. in. And have a pleasant evening and a happy Thanksgiving to everybody. Thank you.